Hey everyone, welcome in to another daily editorial here on the KE Report. I'm getting an update from Snowline Gold following up on a news release from yesterday, October 10th. Drill results from the Rogue Project all around this valley deposit. A total of seven holes were released. Two headline holes, hole 81, intersecting 2.1 grams per ton gold over 433 meters. There's also some higher grade sections within that result. And hole 84, 1.3 grams per ton gold over 273 meters. Look, uh, there are some other holes in here that just aren't headline holes, but still a lot of the drilling hitting long intercepts of gold mineralization. I'll post a link to the news release in the show notes so you all can read over these results. Snowline Gold is traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol SGD and on the OTCQB under the symbol SNWGF. I am chatting with Scott Birdall, CEO of Snowline, to review this news release. Scott, I guess just from a high-level standpoint, a lot of this drilling is in and around the current resource, that 7 million ounce resource. Talk to us about the potential of adding ounces through this drilling, please. Sure. So yeah, there are a few ways that we can do that. And, uh, you know, obviously stepping out and expanding or infilling and getting better grades than we were expecting. So, and you know, even if we get the same grades that we were expecting, give or take, you know, it's still significant to basically upgrade the resource as well. And, you know, this release has a bit of, well, basically all three of those ingredients, you know, the highlight holes are, are in the heart of things, as you might expect, but still they're filling up meaningful gaps in the data from earlier. And they are outperforming the model. So both 81 and 84 had some pleasant surprises in terms of the grade. And even 81, I think the overall effect will be somewhat minor, but still it's encouraging, you know, and that's part of why infill is so important. It redefines our geological model locally. We expected that hole to collar in the sedimentary rock, like the country rock outside of the intrusion. But when we got through the, uh, the surface cover there and into bedrock, we were already in the intrusion. And so If you look at uh, figure uh, two in the release, you can actually see there's kind of this diagonal line, this diagonal limit to the the purple boxes, basically greater than two grams per ton, uh, a few red, greater than one gram per ton in the block model uh, that's used to uh, inform the resource estimate. And that line is is now just an artificial artifact. At the time, the, the only hard geological constraint in our resource modeling was that boundary because the you know whether the like a a certain space is in the intrusion or in the horn fells has says a lot about its prospectivity uh, just from what we understand about this system the most of the mineralization and the highest grade mineralization is within the intrusion uh, and so our understanding of the boundary of the intrusion at that time was that kind of diagonal line you can see there's gaps and low grade stuff right beyond it and, and uh, i think if you look back at the resource estimate uh, when we break it out into the sub shells that first shell has a bunch of waste material that uh, I think this hole helped to take care of some of that uh, by just filling in these gaps where that waste material was just open space that we thought was uh, beside the intrusion. Now we understand, okay, it's in the intrusion. So that's good to see. And then, yeah, on the periphery, some of the bigger step out holes, you know, if you look at table two and skim down some of the numbers in the context of the big uh, beefy kind of like right through the heart of the system numbers, like, you know, the the headline 433.5 meters at 2.1 grams per ton, it's obviously hard to compete with that. But uh, when you think about the type of system that this is, I mean, we're looking at, at cutoff grades around 0.4 for our resource estimate right now. And that envisions a mill only scenario. If you think about, uh, and, and basically all of these holes have intervals above that grade, some of them quite substantial. But again, they don't really hold much water when you compare them just uh, one-to-one against holes like 81. Uh, nonetheless, they're still significant. We're building volume. And when you start to think about other options too, like the the kind of the classic model for this deposit type is Fort Knox in Alaska. They started with a uh, mill-based mining operation and they kind of went through that high grade and they became a hybrid mill heap leach setup. And so, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity there when you look at these grades of, you know, the 0.3s and 0.2s and, you know, many intervals of that kind of mineralization that at this point, given our approach to the system, it's all classified as waste rock. But when you start to think about the volume. And as you get out further from the central part of the resource or just any circular shape, you know, every kind of meter out, you're adding more in volume, you're adding a bigger and bigger ring. So, you know, there's a, a lot of volume of this lower grade stuff to to chase and even some sniffs of some higher grade mineralization, some runs of 
of uh, ground per ton plus that uh, is both uh, near the edges and uh, and even outside of the, the current uh, pick constraint for the resource estimate. So uh, we'll see how it all shakes out once we get all of our assays in and you know everything done and dusted. But for now, it's certainly encouraging signs. So drilling into some of that lower grade material or material that you thought was waste that you maybe could put a lower grade gold value on, does that really move the needle for the overall resource or would that change at all the initial pit shell design from that resource? I think that the initial, like in terms of just what you would go after early stage, it, it probably won't have a ton of an effect because, you know, things like hole 81 and what I talked about with our understanding, our better understanding of what the mineralization looks like near surface, that'll have some uh, some effects I would expect. But uh, but ultimately, you know, we, we know where the the very high grade mineralization is. And so, you know, we, we kind of know how we would begin on a system like this. And ultimately, you know, we have a pretty good understanding of of what a system would look like for the first uh, quite a while. And so when you were talking about kind of bigger, lower grade things, I do think it could have a meaningful impact on the numbers, but it's more about kind of the longevity of the project and, and that kind of a thing. You know, I don't think that uh, it's going to be a huge driver for a kind of day one value, or at least, you know, changing that strategy right out of the gate. But certainly, you know, there's a lot of value to add in terms of just increasing that scale and the size of the thing and, and knowing that you have an asset that can produce for hopefully a very long time. Okay, let's look back to that figure too, that cross section of hole 81. Now you mentioned, you went, you went through this cross section and the one thing that stood out to me is that this hole was drilled in a completely uh, different orientation from all the other holes and we can see some of that higher grade, the mineralization closer to surface where you had gray blocks there. So I guess you weren't really getting any credit for that mineralization there. But what was the strategy and the theory around drilling this hole in this completely different orientation through most of this resource? Well, some of the uh, holes from the along that southwest side come in this direction. And, you know, if you look at uh, what I was talking about, and you can see it in that figure pretty well, just that boundary with the with the between the hornfells the sediments and the granite eye right that you know once you get out into that hornfells is pretty much just gray blocks there are a few sniffs here and there's some nice little high grade hits but so far we haven't seen a ton at least on the southwest margin that hangs together very well and so you know you can picture in kind of drilling a fence across this if you're to kind of keep going with that southwest orientation eventually you're just going to be you know setting up a whole pad going through all the rigmarole of putting a new hole into place just to drill through you know 20 or 50 meters or so of intrusion and, and then going out into the hornfells. And so coming back allows us not only to get drill meters into that near surface rock in that area, but also at depth, we can kind of try to thread the needle or not so much a needle, but some pretty sizable gaps still to explore and probe at depth. And so you can kind of take care of those near surface meters and explore uh, and, and infill at depth. So it basically uh, ticks a, a few different boxes. And it's also good to, you know, if you're drilling off a system, you never want to do every single hole at the same orientation. You want to get some understanding of uh, if there's some bias to, to different drill directions or that kind of a thing. And so we have drilled uh, quite a few holes in this opposite direction. We've also drilled holes, you know, straight along strike of the system, uh, vertically off to the west as in hole 82 in this release. And, and we're seeing, you know, where we have the data to compare side by side, you know, we're seeing pretty good consistency, pretty much any direction that you drill this in. So overall, with the drilling that you've done over the last few years, can you say that you have found the true extent of the system, especially the higher grade component of the system at Valley specifically? I think near surface, we're getting a pretty good handle on it. You know, still meaningful tweaks like, like that with 81 as we better define the geological model. Uh, but we are still chasing it uh, at depth and and also just kind of down dip as it sort of forms a, a bit of a cupola in, in dipping off in, in various different directions. And so, yeah, we're still getting a handle of how that mineralization uh, evolves as it plunges down. We're seeing some interesting character to mineralization down there where we're getting, uh, and, you know, we've known about this for a couple of years where you, the gold gets a lot more uh, coarse, but, uh, you know, the veins get more sparse. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that presents it, its kind of own risk reward profile in terms of what you're chasing down there. And so we've had a, a few holes that have really held together well at depth, others that uh, haven't so much. 
and yeah, so we're still, it's, that's kind of the, uh, the frontier with Valley now is, is the push and pull between uh, chasing those things. And as they get deeper, you know, do the economics hold together and that kind of thing. But yeah, it's like I said earlier, we know pretty much where that first shovelful would go and the first many after that. And, you know, we're pretty happy with that. That was part of the, the rationale in uh, coming out with the resource when we did. And, but yeah, uh, still now exploring it to kind of find what the, you know, what the later stages of this system or, you know, any uh, future potential operation out there would uh, look like. Okay. So Scott, there's still a lot of drill results pending here. The news release says assays pending for over 24,600 meters in 45 holes across six targets at the Rogue and Einerson projects. Talk to us about what we can expect, where these holes are coming from, anything noteworthy that we should have our eye out for with all these drill results still to come. Yeah, I mean, this has been a, a huge season for us. And, you know, we've, for most of the year, had uh, five drills turning out there. We had the two camps going. So it's it's been a pretty big phase change from previous seasons. And, and we, you know, I'm really proud of the the team for being able to put such a season together. And yeah, at Valley, you know, we have drilled almost 25, actually, I think a little over 25,000 meters this year. And so, you know, compared to just shy of 28,000 meters that were used to inform the resource estimate, we basically doubled the amount of drilling. And, and the vast majority of those assays are still to come. Uh, similarly, on regional targets, we've gotten a lot more aggressive than we ever have. And we've gone back to Jupiter. I think we did between four and 5,000 meters there. Uh, and having the drill, well, the two drills actually, jumping around to various regional targets. And so i um, keen to see results from from first tests of a lot of these different systems like Sydney and Aurelius and Avalanche Creek. So yeah, lots to come. And we're pretty excited to see how the dust settles as we kind of go into the winter season here. All right. One other aspect of this news release that we should highlight is this Plata site cleanup. You have pictures of some old tanks and even an old truck that is on site here from, I believe, back in the 70s and 80s. Is this simply community relations work for the company to continue to keep the area that you're operating in, that you're exploring in, clean? Well, I mean, on, on some level, yes, I think it, it really aligns with our values, you know, beyond just kind of an outward facing, you know, this is the message we want to give. It's fundamentally, you know, this is what we want to do. I grew up in the Yukon, exploring in the Yukon. And, you know, so both the industry and the, the place are, are you know, a strong part of, of who I am. And, and I know that, you know, regardless of where they're from, that most of us with the company or all of us with the company are, uh, are pretty keen to see things done at high standard and, you know, set a, a really good example uh, for the industry. I, I think that we this actually almost flew completely under the radar. And then someone mentioned bringing it up as a social media post. And then I thought, oh, you know, actually, this is is something that we should communicate a little more broadly. So this is almost just done, not as a PR sort of a thing, but just to do it, you know, and to get things cleaned up and just to, to have that site uh, remediated. But at the same time, obviously, it, it has positive effects. And, and, you know, hopefully we can continue to build on the legacy that we have been creating and the identity and the culture that we've been forging as a company. We were very happy to get the Robert Leckie Award for Environmental Stewardship last year for, for similar efforts on uh, smaller scale abandoned sites related to exploration in the region previously. But the other thing, you know, to just kind of, I guess, more investor facing is that this is an area where mining has occurred in the past. And, you know, that car is is one of a couple there. And there's some, you know, big underground equipment, some big surface equipment, a lot of other things on that site. Uh, and, you know, that was all brought in along the winter trail. It was used to support underground mining at the Plata Silver Mine and the Inca Silver Mine, you know, small scale, but nonetheless uh, done for a couple of seasons. And, and yeah, so, you know, this is a place where things can happen and things can happen for uh, targets and, and uh, projects that, you know, at least at that stage are uh, much smaller than what we've uh, put together and onto the table with Valley. So, you know, it's not far from where we are. That site's about eight kilometers from our uh, project boundary uh, outside of it. Uh, but And it's about 30 kilometers from Valley with a, a pretty clear and uh, logistically simple corridor connecting the two. So, you know, it's, yeah, it, it highlights that, you know, we're not as remote as, as I have heard said. Okay. I think we've all heard that, but hey, keep on drilling, keep on releasing these results and keep us up to date on what else is going on at the project. 
A lot of drill results still to come, so Scott will be following up with you as more of that news is released. Again, Scott Birdall, CEO of Snowline Gold, traded on the TSX Venture Exchange under the symbol SGD, and the OTCQB under the symbol SNWGF. Thanks for your time today, Scott. Awesome. Thank you, Corey.